Hi everyone and welcome to Coral Arts. I'm April Angeletta and I'm here with our artistic director, Scott Tucker. And our guest today is Augusta Reed Thomas. And she was writing a uh, commission for our friends over at the Cathedral Choral Society. So she's actually not uh, one of the composers on Music by Women on a Mission, but because there has been so much music in Washington and we've all been trying to feature women composers, we wanted to make sure that we interviewed some of the composers on our friends' concerts as well. And it's really exciting that she was writing a new piece that was going to be premiered at their performance, March of the Women. So Scott and Augusta, Gusty, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, April. Well, Gusty, how great to see you and uh, to talk to you again. I, we were just chatting before the things rolled that uh, we first met through our good friend, Stephen Stuckey, who has since passed away, but from Cornell back in 2005. And um, you wrote a couple of things for the groups at Cornell. And um, I, you know, I don't know if you remember them, they, you know, the short pieces back then, but one was uh, for the men. Uh, you did a piece um, uh, of a, uh, uh, who's the uh, poet? Um, it was a, it was called the rewaking. The rewaking, and it's right? By William, uh, William Carlos, Carlos Williams. Williams. Right, right, right. A wonderful piece, and we did it not just at the premiere, but we did it a couple of times. And I I don't know if I think that you have also rescored it at SATB. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, and that's wonderful. So this is a great piece, and and also uh, for us, you did uh, for the women uh, Emily Dickinson piece a couple of years later, uh, Juggler of Day. Uh, also a cappella, uh, very challenging piece, but a wonderful soundscape. I, I wonder if we could just start by talking about, I've heard you talk before about how fascinated you are with sound. And I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you approach a poem and you're so fascinated by sound, you know, how are you marrying those two things exactly? Well, let me start by just thanking you, Scott, for including me in this podcast. It's incredibly nice of you, and I am so happy to see you and really grateful uh, for this opportunity to speak with you and, and about my work, especially at a time when so many people are you know, dealing with incredible health issues and, and other issues, financial issues and so forth. I feel very blessed, so thank you. And I remember well our collaborations at Cornell with, with great pleasure. And I have this weird thing when I write a piece, I just memorize it. So like when you say the name of the piece, it just pops right, like it just goes zoop, right back into my <laughs> brain. Right. And I remember the beautiful men's voices. It was just so beautiful. And that, that, that piece is so simple. Loved it. And then to write The Juggler of Day was super fun on the Emily Dickinson. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that's basically a poem about a sunrise and then a long sunset. And so mm -hmm. I tried to set it like really bright at the front end of the piece with the women's voices in kind of chords, sort of bell-like structures. And then as the sun fades, it turns into this multi-part counterpoint that just continues mm -hmm. to weave its way all the way back until the very last line that the juggler of day, meaning the sun, is gone.
it's just like typical Emily Dickinson. I, I just love those texts and thinking about the images, you know, what does the sunrise sound like and what does this de long denouement, because most of the poem is about how the sun is setting. Right. And like most of the lines of the poem are on that side of the, the moment. And, uh, and then the William Carlos Williams is basically a love song. You know, it's hmm. just about this incredible love, uh, uh, it's just so, so beautiful. So I, I like to really try to set the poem because I think if the, yeah. if the poet has said something and then I just like add music, like one plus one, if it equals two, it's not enough. It has to be like the poem is one and I add the music one and then it, and then the chorus and the conductor and everybody, and then it adds up to 28. You know, it's, it can't just add up to two. You have to kind of make <laughs> something of it. And I love writing these short choral mm -hmm. works. They're just so much fun and uh, really carefully picking the text. So, yes, I remember the whole Cornell collaboration with you with immense, um, immense joy, actually, and so helpful to me that you reached out and, and supported me in my life's work at that time. And like helped me to have these wonderful projects. It was great. It was a, a time that I think you were making a transition right then. Uh, um, uh, you were, you had been teaching, but I think at the time you were you decided you were going to stop teaching and and just devote yourself to composition, just around that time. But I, I wanted to say, um, I think. One thing I remember uh, when you visited and we talked and uh, and maybe you were talking to a, a, a bunch of our composers at Cornell at the time, but I just remember being so impressed and fascinated how much uh, poetry and literature was in your mind uh, that, that you had at the tip of your tongue. And I I don't know if you remember that but, or, or whether people have remarked on that before, but it's something I noticed right away. Um, you know, some musicians are so immersed in only music that um, they almost forget about text, but it seems to be such a big part of who you are. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that and where, where that came from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love poetry. I love it. And it's mm -hmm. a sort of a side area of interest for me. For instance, I have walls of poetry books, like, and I've bought, I've purchased all the recordings of every poet reading their poem. So I've, I've started to memorize the poems by the sound of how the poet reads it and the tempo and the, the color of their voice. Like Wallace Stevens mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of order at Key West. He, he, something like he does it so slowly. So it's like, she sang beyond the genius of the sea. The water never formed. Like, it's like music. You know, you just, you can memorize it because it's a piece of music, basically. And uh, I'm a, totally obsessed. I listen over and over again to the New Yorker Poetry Podcasts. I've heard all of them five, six, seven, eight times. And I, and I read poems, oh, you know, every day. So it's just the one thing that kind of has captured me. And I love to think about line and image. And for instance, if, if in a poem you add a dash, like an Emily Dickinson dash, like the whole poem changes. You have a, a stanza break. You, you put a period. You invert one word in, in, in a different way and, and the whole meaning changes. And the great poets are, of uh, enormous inspiration to me. I was thinking also that with, with poetry, you can read a 20 word poem and it can describe the whole universe. Now, if you had to describe the poem in 20 words, you couldn't, you'd need like paragraphs or pages or an essay. Like here's what this poem is doing. It'd be like a whole essay. <laughs> and then the poem is only 20 words and they're the perfect 20 words that say the whole thing. That really appeals to me. And in my own music, uh, you know, I, I like short forms and I like to sculpt every single sound and polish it and write down to the dash, the dot, the decrescendo, the, the harmonic uh, rhythm, uh, the, the rhythmic syntax, all the things that I'm working out every day, the counterpoint. Um, I, I definitely come to it with a poet's sensibility. Even though I do write long works, locally they're all like, 
it's all little poems that are all worked out. So it's not just my interest in poetry, but it's an interest in concision, clarity of thought, uh, having something to say and saying it and stopping, you know, just like that's all you need to say. If you look at mm -hmm. one of the Bach preludes or the few, let, pick anything, you know, let's take a prelude. It's two and a half minutes. One of the well-tempered clavier ones, pick any one. It's like a whole universe in it. The thing is two and a half minutes long, maybe three minutes. Or a Goldberg variation is 45 seconds and it's got an entire universe. So that that really appeals to me as an artist. And I think it, it's, it can be heard in all of my work, I, I, I believe, that kind of sensibility. So yeah, the poets have been a huge, they continue to be a, just a deep source of inspiration. That that really answers the question what I was getting at. Was trying to figure out this relationship between sound and and poetry, and and you you've really articulated it beautifully. Let's talk a little bit about this piece you were going to write for the Cathedral Choral Society because I know the text is by, or part of the text at least is is by your sister uh, Cami. So uh, you I know were one of uh, ten siblings. Is that right? You were the tenth of ten. Tenth of ten. Amazing. So, um, you know, I, I mean, how much did you learn from your siblings and how much influence are they on your, on your life? Well, I love my siblings. They're fabulous. And <laughs> they're, they're a huge inspiration to me. I learned a lot from them. I still learn a lot from them. And I love to be with them. They're all, you know, very bright and smart and um, engaged and engaging and artistic and you know they're they're all um, just really interesting people in what they're doing with their lives and I treasure having them in my life and the, the piece for the Cathedral Choral Society my eldest sister who's the oldest who's a published poet her third book is forthcoming uh, and I'm the youngest, so we're like, the book ends. Um, I thought it would be fun to set a poem of hers or two, especially because this whole project was about women and the march of women and women working together. And I thought, what better way than me to work with my sister? Like at the fundamental level, that just gets right to the point of the matter. And so I asked her to write a poem about essentially about peace, the, a plea for peace, essentially, but that had imagery to do with the sun and the moon. And that I wanted a lot of open vowels and that I did not want it to be too long, <laughs> like maybe 20 words each. So 40 words total or something. I didn't want to be setting the phone book with like pages of words blah, 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 because I like melismas. <laughs> and I like building chords on open vowels yeah. <laughs> that the chorus can like build around. And so I, those were the, the only things I said, I think. Um, and I didn't want anything to be dark or ugly because my music is so sort of radiant and sort of positive. So oh, I, those were, yeah. and then she wrote these yeah. gorgeous, gorgeous, stunning poems, beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. And um, yeah. And so then, I, off I went and, and made the piece. And of course, when we are able to do the premiere, she'll come and her whole family will come. And it's really nice to have a living poet there, you know, at the pre-concert lecture yeah. or like on a podcast like this. Like, what, are the, what is the poet thinking about when some composer calls you up? And so anyway, it, it was super fun. It's our sort of our first collaboration. And um, I'm, I'm really excited for whenever it is re-premiered and I feel very grateful to the artists because they practiced for so many months like from January to February and then suddenly like t 10 days before it gets canceled but they already learned the piece. I know that's uh, that that's a tough situation. I didn't realize that she actually wrote the poems for this occasion. I thought maybe they were pre pre-written but that's really interesting. No, they were I I commissioned them from her, I guess you would say. Um Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was fun. I mean, partly I, I commissioned them because I, I wanted very specific things, um, right. such as those I mentioned. Right. Uh, David from the Cathedral Choral Society asked if there's any 
anywhere specific in the music that the audience might be able to hear the collaboration with your sister? I might, I might not be understanding your question, I'm sorry, but it seems to me that the whole composition is the collaboration. Uh, because I set very much the imagery of her poems in, in the music. And so I think of the entire thing as, as a collaboration. I, I, I see it as very integrated and very holistic. And at the fundamental level, you know, braiding from her words into my music and out into the voices and into the orchestra and into the beautiful space of the, of the cathedral. So to me, it, it's all a very integrated uh, network. He also, I saw the questions he sent, and he, and he asked an interesting question about acoustics. And, you know, the acoustics of the National Cathedral are particularly live and resonant. And um, a more general question would be, you know, where do acoustics play in your, in your thought process? Yes. With that piece, I was very much thinking of the acoustics. Uh, because I'm aware that there's a five second delay. And in a, in a setting like that, if you try to do very fast hockets, for example, you know, like, you know, it, it just turns into a, a cloud. Um, on the other hand, if you have a piece with a slightly slower harmonic rhythm and these big chords that kind of unfold in an let's say an organ-esque way, like playing the organ and letting the sounds so that, um, if, if an A natural is still ringing in the cathedral and then the next chord comes in on whatever pitch it comes in, you hear that relation across o over what would be a bar of rest. But, you know, the sound is not a bar of rest. So, yes, I do have a lot of lift in the composition where I'll build up to this huge chord and then have like two beats and then we're back. But the two beats are actually full of resonance. And I did that on purpose. I tried to like sing it and conduct it and feel it. Like, all right, how is this going to feel in real time? And I, I think I put something in the front matter that if the piece is done in an extremely dry acoustic at some point, um, you know, that, that one just has to take that into account that it was built for a piece of a very round acoustic. So for instance, in a dry acoustic, you might do the piece at a slightly faster tempo as one example. But... Uh, I love the idea of writing for that acoustic. And I'm very sensitive to acoustics, always. Like, I always want to know which hall are we doing this in? And where's the audience sitting? And you, which side are the violins? Are they divided or are they together? And are the brass centered or are they off to one side? And is the percussion, where's the percussion? Like, I want to know everything <laughs> because it, I... Uh, like even I was writing them saying, are the bass singers near the double basses or are the double basses on the other side? Like things like that. I asked a bunch of questions like that. So I, I knew um, how to orchestrate essentially. And so I, I, get, I get very attached to tempos and the acoustic mise-en-scene around the piece. Definitely. Uh, and typically, I don't love dry concert halls. I like halls that have a little bit of resonance. Although to make a recording, of course, working in a dry hall is great. You can hear a pin drop and you can get every nuance just buttoned up. So it, it depends what, what the activity is. Were there any other questions from the, the singer, uh, April, that you had? Uh, well, I have one more from David, which is also like right along the lines of what you're talking about with the orchestration. And he was asking if, if you could talk about some of the major differences between composing for instruments and instrumental ensembles versus composing for voices and vocal ensembles. And if there are any unique challenges in writing for voices. Hmm. Well, first of all, let me thank David for his three excellent questions. That's super nice of him. And yes, I do approach every instrument as a unique object for which I'm composing. Not only every instrument, but every specific player. So for instance, am I writing for a violinist who's very bravura and kind of, you know, or if am I writing for somebody who's, you know, playing a lot of early music and is more interior? Are you writing for 
young young girls chorus? Are you writing for uh, the Berlin Philharmonic? I mean, you really have to think of not just orchestra in general, but which orchestra and who's conducting and w- what the concert hall is. So I tend to be very, very, I try to tailor make my pieces. That's the best way I can put it. Um, for instance, in Scott's uh, chorus up in Cornell, those unbelievable men that I just completely, that, that was just, and the women, oh my God, it was unbelievable. But anyway, um, you know, Scott had told me a lot of them don't read, several of them don't read music. You know, they're, they're learning partly by going through uh, and just learning it. And, you know, that's just such a beautiful thought. I just love that, that some young man can be part of this chorus and maybe doesn't read as well as the person standing next to him. You know, that's a certain thing that's just gorgeous. And then, you know, on the other hand, writing for these, you know, ensembles or things. So I try, I just try to tailor make also, what have I been asked to make? You know, for instance, for the, the the big choral and orchestra piece that we were talking about, it was a very specific occasion. And what fits that occasion? I mean, we're talking about uh, the Nineteenth Amendment and women's suffrage, and and you know, wh- where does that go out to, and how how do we follow the paths where that leads to today? And you know, really not just writing you know some random piece like oh, I'll set Emily Dickinson. Why not? You know, no, because that doesn't really address the commission. And so I, I, I like to tailor make things actually, uh, because it's, it's, you know, it really is very focusing. And yet on the other hand, if you write a piece for chorus and orchestra, you want another chorus and orchestra to be able to do it. So it, it has to have a certain universality to it. But I, I do think it's also important to honor the musicians that have taken the risk to commission you. They've asked you for something specific. They've, uh, they're supporting your life's work and so forth to really do my best to uh, address that specific thing. I, you know, I love your last point and it, and it, it reminds me again of, of something that strikes me really about you and working with you is your sense of gratitude um, to performers particularly but to really to everybody and that you're that you're working with and and um i'm wondering i guess you know a, a lot of us uh miss that message <laughs> of gratitude and what an important part of life that is and I, i'm wondering you know kind of where that comes from does that come from your upbringing does that come from experience you know where where does that sense of gratitude come from well, I, I guess I would say very bluntly that the reason I write music is to express gratitude. Because I love music. I love it. I've loved it since I was this little girl. I used to lie under the piano. And then when I was like four, I started making up songs that had like two notes in them, like plank plunk. And that would be a whole song and stuff like that. And then I was lucky to have piano lessons and sing in choir and play guitar and play trumpet all the way through college as a performance major. So I have such an empathy for players because I, that was my whole side of it all for so long. Although I composed all the way through that Mm. um, also, but I, I feel like um, to be able to get up and write music for somebody that's invited you to do that and that's going to perform it. I mean, that's just, it's unbelievable. It's, it's something to be so grateful for. (laughs) And also I think, you know, to have health, to be able to be healthy enough, because these pe- these pieces take a lot of work, or at least mine, it takes me a lot of work. Maybe I'm slower than others, but I mean, I like to make everything <laughs> really tailored and totally polished and sculpted and, you know, proportions and all of this. So, I mean, it's hard work. So you have to have good health and a sort of an intense work ethic to get all this done. But it's still so yeah. fortunate. One, I feel so fortunate to be able to do that. And, you know, when I listen to music, I'm so grateful for the players who played it. And like like Bach, if you hear somebody do any Bach, I just, I just am so happy, deeply happy, because this happens to be my favorite composer. But, you know, or, or Mahler or Ravel or uh, Ella Fitzgerald or <laughs> Mingus or... Uh, you know, Miles or, or 
you know, any number of, of people, Bill Evans, all, all these amazing, I mean, incredible, Louis Armstrong. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And they spent their whole life impassioned about music. And, you know, a lot of them just made music till, the, till they died, basically, like literally. And I probably will be exactly the same, like on my deathbed writing down, you know, two little notes about <laughs> something. Because it's just, it's just <laughs> such a, a, such a joy. But it, it's also, you know, it, it's a, it's an, it's hard like I've spent my entire life actually devoted to music. I don't have children. You know, I just work all day long about everything. That's all I do. I'm obsessed with, with composing music and also helping other people with their music in lots of ways. But, um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to do it. And there's a lot of things I'm really bad at, like long lists, like really long <laughs> lists of stuff I'm really bad at. Like I can't cook you know, et cetera. It goes on from there. All the basic stuff, I can't do any of it. But if, if I, if I could, if you just like sit me at a piano and say, go, then I, that, that's the one little thing that I actually am starting to get good at. Like I can do that. <laughs> so, you know, it takes an enormous focus to get to that level. And then when you finally, after 40 years of hard work, you start to get better, you know, then you want to do it. Hmm. You know, it's funny to hear you talk because you 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 had uh, earlier success than most people, uh, most composers, and most people. I mean, you you were a, you were already a great success in in the music world at age twenty three or so as a composer. Is that not when you began as the composer in residence at Chicago Symphony, or am I conflating things? Um, I'm trying to think, let's see. I mean, I was just an obsessive writer, like just yeah. since I was such a young child, it's hard for right. me to even remember which year was which, but right. I also, I mean, I probably shouldn't admit this, but uh, cause it's totally not a bad thing, but I don't have a master's degree and I don't have a doctorate. I, in other words, I just went straight into writing and in a way I do have a master's degree and about 10 doctorates because of learning from the musicians. Like if mm -hmm. you stand in front of a great chorus and you spent eight months making a piece, that's a very good education. <laughs> you know, it may not be a degree, but, you know, to be able to work with those musicians is, is like a degree in a certain, it's like a life, mm -hmm. in a, a life degree or something like that. So I just yeah. was so in, in the mode of doing it so young. And I was very fortunate to have people support, like give me the chance to, to do it. And, you know, to give me a chance to improve at it. But I, I also didn't spend, you know, many years getting a, a master's and then, you know, six years getting a doctorate. And then I, I just went straight in. So I guess I was really very young and very fortunate. And I also, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I worked really hard too, like every day, all day. Um, but it's not really work because it's what I love to do. So it's just, it's just living. And, and so now, uh, I mean, you've been in this world um, of composing concert music for a while now. Um, and now you, you know, I guess, how has your attitude toward teaching evolved or changed over time? I mean, you were a teacher at a, at a pretty young age, and now you're, you're, uh, you're teaching again. How has that philosophy changed or attitude toward teaching? Yeah, I did start teaching very young at the Eastman School of Music, which I loved. Uh, I was an assistant professor there, and then I was an associate professor there. Uh, great school. And uh, then I taught at Northwestern. And, of course, I teach in the summers at Tanglewood and at Aspen and, and at other festivals. So I, I feel like I'm teaching all the time. And now, of, of course, mm -hmm. at the University of Chicago. Um, so I love to teach, but I, I think of it as three circles that interlock. So like the first circle is Gusty the composer. And then the, if you can like put the second circle in the first one like that, it's Gusty the teacher. And you can't really separate them because I'm making work every day and then I'm talking to people who are making work and I can talk to them about it because I'm doing it all day. It's just sort of the same thing. I, I've, I like it, it's, it's, I love it actually, I love my students. It's super natural, it's like natural. 
to share. I mean, I get, I, I really enjoy teaching. And then the third thing I would say in terms of those two circles is a third circle, which I can't do with my fingers, which is what I would call something like citizenship. Because I've done a lot of things like, you know, working for the Chicago Symphony for a decade and starting the Music Now series. And I was the chair of the board of the American Music Center, which is a, a huge job. And I serve on the Copeland board and the Ditson board and the Kusovitsky board. And I'm the vice president of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And I run a center and I founded an ensemble and I ran this huge ear taxi festival. And so in, in short, I, that third circle I've done a, an enormous amount of that. You know, I'm not just sitting here doing my own work. I've tried to be really generous, like do, do this and do this and then do that. But the way I see it is it's sort of all one circle. It's like that. They, they all feed each other. If I'm going to write and then teach someone, then I want to help them get their piece played. And then if I want to get them help, they're please, you know, and then get them a commission and get them a performance and, and make a festival where everybody can have their pieces and so on. I don't, you can't really separate those because I just live all of those, if you know what I mean. I get it. Yeah. Well, uh, before we wrap up, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, how you're doing now with, with this uh, pandemic upon us and, you know, has this uh, changed your life in any way? Um, and, you know, how is it going for you? Well, I, I, I'm very sad for people who've lo who are losing their lives and for people who are very sick because this is just not nice and I want them to all get better and I hope that we have, uh, what are they saying, bent the curve, as it were, and that I believe in science. I believe the scientists are working overtime all around the world to find uh, medications that work and will eventually find a vaccine. So I, I'm an optimist, for sure. How long that will take, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of my own personal life, I mean, I didn't know life was like this, actually. Like, I didn't even know this was a thing. Because my life is usually like, get up, race, go teach, run to the airport, get to the airport, get somewhere at midnight, get up, run, go to the rehearsal, go to the board meeting, get back, go there, do this, come back, put makeup on in the car, like do phone calls. Blah, blah, blah. It was like this for 30 years. I mean, trips every twice a week going somewhere, concerts, pre-concert lectures, post-concert events, um, another project here. Blah, 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 blah. And so all of a sudden, 30 years of that just goes like, stop. And at the first month, I was like, what is going on? I don't even know what to do. Like I told you, I can't cook. I can't do anything. You know, so like all of a sudden I'm sitting here going, like, what am I doing? But, you know, of course I'm teaching full time, which is great by Zoom. And I run a, I run a center and I run an ensemble. So like I've got plenty to do. Um, but it just was, it's like a body shock. Like I, I, I don't think I've ever been home this long, certainly not in about 30 or 35 years. So, but now a month, so I hated it. But now a month later, I'm like, oh. I can actually like have breakfast and, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just like these things that just seemed so normal. I think they don't, they weren't normal. So, and then in terms of composing every minute, I'm not doing all the other stuff I do. I'm composing nonstop, um, like every day. So that's, I feel very lucky and fortunate, but, um, you know, one has to be really mindful of the whole society, the whole culture and making sure everybody comes through this. Okay. And we can restart. And I hope we all come out of this a lot stronger. I know a lot of composers are like, why should I write? I don't know if anyone will play it. I don't know if I'll get a commission for it. I don't know if they'll ever do it. I mean, I'm not going to write it. Why would I work that hard? You know, like I've heard a lot of people say that. And I understand. Like, I get it. This is not a, it's a normal thing. Like, yes. But I am like completely the opposite. I'm writing like like there was no tomorrow. Like even if I'm just going, I mean, because it's what I do. And, you know, then when this is all over, we'll just see what happens. But um, I want to keep making the pieces. And we're glad that you do. I mean, I am. I, I think, um, you know, you're just so such an extraordinary uh, composer and person and so what a, what a pleasure to talk to you thank you for taking the time to be with us today. thank you Bestie. i mean it's so generous of you to do this thank you very much <laughs>